Good day to everyone. This is the Meek Street Church of Christ. We're studying God's Word today. Hope you have your Bible handy that you look at what the Scriptures have to say. We're going to have a lot of Scriptures on the board today, so you can follow along and, and read for yourself whatever translation you're using of the Scriptures. Uh, that will be helpful to know uh, what we're doing, what we're studying God's Word. is The Word of God is complex. It has a lot of things that our lessons for us to learn today. And one lesson we talked about a couple weeks ago is about the idea of apostasy and how apostasy can happen even to large scale people, a lot of groups of people I might say. And in Acts chapter 20, 28 to 31, that's exactly what Paul is speaking about. The idea that people can, uh, as whole congregations can be un become unfaithful to the Lord the Lord can remove the candlestick that is a part of that worship and work, and they can become unfaithful just like individuals can, can become unfaithful. Uh, it's because of individual apostasy we see that congregational, when all, everybody is doing the same thing that's wrong, then that is apostasy in a whole scale uh, sense of the term. In Acts chapter 20, Verse 28, Peter Paul says, Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock, and from among your own selves men will rise speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. And so people can be drawn away that Paul's warning the church there, don't let this happen to you. It become uh, something that happens among the elders that the Bible tells us Paul's warning about through prophecy of this. And it did take place. And the last part he says, therefore be on the alert, remembering that night and day for a period of three years, I did not cease to admonish each one with tears. Paul felt very strongly about this and that he was very saddened to think that people weren't going to be saved because of their leaving the truth. Some will depart from the faith, is what uh, the Bible tells Paul to say in another place, and how that that's a danger, isn't it? It's something that can happen to us if we don't stand firm to the truth and, and get off into false teaching and error and practices and doing things that are really not what God has called us to do as the church as believers. And so how apostasy happens in the church today, as we want to know, how is it that churches can leave their faithfulness, churches that were once strong, standing for the truth, and only for the truth. And later on, because of the devil, his, his ways of trying to tempt us to leave the firmness and the soundness of the faith. And that's exactly what happens. And and this is how apostles, that's why lessons like this are needed today, because we need to know how to stand firm and to buy the truth and sell it not, as Proverbs 31, 31 tells us, or Proverbs, uh, the writer tells us about that. And so we need to know how it is that we can do that, to stay firm in times where people may be leaving the truth, much like Israel had cycles of apostasy in the book of Judges. And Paul said that would happen uh, in 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 3. And this is from the New American Standard Bible, which actually uses the word apostasy instead of the word falling away, the two word falling away, the compound word there. But it actually refers to apostasy. That's what the Greek text actually shows us in 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 3. It says, let no one in any way deceive you, for it will not come unless the apostasy, or a, a translation, I said the falling away, comes first. And the man of lawlessness is revealed the son of destruction. And evidently that has already taken place because there was the time of great apostasy. Men left the truth and they went off into various doctrines and creeds and commandments of men. And that's why we teach that denominationalism, all that we see how men departed the faith, began with the elders of the church and how that they started going into apostasy thinking that there's leading elders and there's bishops and there's archbishops and finally there's a pope. All that is what refers to as the apostasy. And you know what's called the Reformation. And people started thinking, well, you know, this is all wrong and it's right. And they were right to thinking that it was all wrong because they had, it was the time of apostasy where men left the truth. 
left the apostles teaching to go off into their own doctrines, their own ways of, of looking at the Bible, own traditions, if you will, rather than the tradition of the scriptures. And that's why it's so dangerous because we want to stand on safe and sure ground by only teaching what the word of God has to say to us today. And I want to suggest how churches can apostatize is when we take small steps away from the truth. That's the individuals that start taking small steps away from the truth. And I have here on the chart here a book that's called Navigating the Winds of Change by Lynn Anderson. And he's one of these people who's called a change agent. He's one who's changed up a lot of things in Churches of Christ and tried to get different various things like instrumental music into the worship of the church, pushing for roles of women to be taking lead in services, things like that. He has basically tried to turn the church upside down from what the New Testament order of what the church actually is. And so he wanted to write a book about this, how you can navigate the winds of change. In other words, if you want to make all these changes, you don't do it by making big changes. You start out with making small steps, and you just baby step in, into apostasy. You're, just, you're going that way, that direction, not by big changes, because everybody would object, and he admits that in the book. I read quite a bit of his book. I had that book in my library, Navigating the Winds of Change. I think a friend of mine may have that now, uh, but I let, that, let him have that book because it's something it's important for us to read because we understand that's how people are trying to get us to change, to leave the safe and sure ground of the truth of God's word. We stand firm on what the Bible teaches, though. We won't make even the smallest step. You know, whether it's a big step or whether it's a small step, just a many small step. If you take one or two small steps, you've made a large leap after a while. Several small steps lead to very big steps later on. As I've heard one brother say in lessons in the past about these types of things. And so we are not to go away from the truth. That's why we must stay static. In other words, we're unmovable in what is the truth. And some people say, well, that's so, so hard shell, that's so narrow minded, and that's legalistic. But it's not what that's not what it is at all. It is simply standing for what God says in his word. And the Bible tells us that this is the temptation even back in the first century. They had people who, who were advocating things, and we have many more today who advocate a lot of strange doctrines. But here Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy 2, 16 to 18, says, but avoid worldly and empty chatter, for it will lead to further ungodliness, and their talk will spread like gangrene. And what everyone can kind of realize what gangrene is. It's, it's kind of a, a problem with the skin where you have skin problems and it, it won't stay static. It's like cancer. It, it's something that does not stay static. It grows. And it's a growth that, it, that hurt, hurts the body. And it is destructive to the body, just like gangrene, cancer. He says their, their talk is like that. Among them are Hymenus and Philetus, Men who have gone astray from the truth saying that the resurrection has already taken place and they upset the faith of some. And it tells us a lot about their doctrines and what they were doing back then. And Paul told Timothy to avoid that and it will lead to further ungodliness. That's the small steps. It's, it's the little steps that keep going on. And you, after a while, you look back and you don't even know where the truth is anymore because of all the small steps that happens when it comes to doctrine, matters, work of the church, and things like that, we get off into apostasy in various ways. In 2 Timothy 3, 13 and 14, here Paul told Timothy, but evil men and imposters will proceed from bad to worse. Notice that level, from bad to worse. There's a growing process. It's in the wrong direction. It's actually a departure, if you will, from soundness. They're going to go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. You, however, continue with the things you have, have learned and become convinced of, knowing from whom you have learned them. In other words, you stay strong. You listen to what the Bible says, what you've learned and what you where you've learned them, and you know that it's safe and sure when you do that. Like I said, the Bible tells us the Proverbs 23, 23, as I should say, which will buy the truth and sell it not. And we're just hang on 
to what God has given us and not get a, away from that. And 2 Timothy 1, verse 13, here's why I say it's nothing wrong to stand fast and hold on to what God has given us because that's what he told Timothy. Paul told Timothy, hold fast the pattern of sound words which you have heard from me in faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. And that idea of holding fast, I looked up the Greek with this, and it's talking about to hold on to an object. It has the sense of holding on to an object to retain in the hand to seize. And that's the idea of holding on. And, and that's why I like the, the idea of the King James and the old new King James, how that they have the idea of holding fast to something. It's like we're hanging on to it and we're not going anywhere from that. That's exactly the meaning that Paul is trying to tell Timothy. You stay right where you need to be. Other men not, might depart from the faith, but you don't take those steps. You don't go away from the truth by changing things that should not be changed. And so that's why we have to stand when it comes to the out of the church and, and stand strong. And it's all because we are standing strong in the preaching of God's word. Now that's another point in apostasy is that when we no longer want sound preaching, biblical preaching, that book, chapter, and verse kind of preaching we, we may have grown up with in, in the younger days, all that has left a lot of people in, and they think, well, where is that today? Because we don't hear a lot of, of soundness in the preaching of, of today. Especially if you watch these televangelists, you're not going to get anything really that's really truly biblical from what they're trying to say. Often it's about give us money and all that. But I'm talking about churches that of the Lord that have left. They don't want sound doctrine. And Paul told Timothy, though, that's what we need, isn't it? He told Timothy in 2 Timothy 4, I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ, who is the judge of the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom. He's giving Timothy a solemn charge. He's saying as strongly as he can that you need to listen to what I say, and this is the charge that you need to take seriously when it comes to preaching of his word. You can't get any higher than by the presence of God and of Christ Jesus who's the judge of living the dead. That's how strongly he was trying to charge Timothy, how the urgency and, 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 and serious a charge it is. And by his appearing as king, you can't get any stronger than that, can you? Well, what's he going to say after that? He tells Timothy to preach the word, be ready in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. And so we have to preach the word and continue in the idea of in season, out of season, be ready in that, is that when people want to hear what you have to say, and even if they don't want to hear what you have to say, you just keep preaching it, whether the gospel is in season or out of season, whether people want the truth or don't want the truth, at least they will hear, and God's word will not go back void to him, that we need to hear, and people can't say, well, I didn't hear what, what your word was, because you know, the preaching of God's word instructs. It rebukes error and exhorts people to do what is right. And we're to reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience. And we're to speak the truth in love, be patient with those, and instruct them in the ways of God as much as we possibly can. That's what we're to do. And that's the charge that God has given us. And notice what he says in the next verse, though. He says, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires. And he's talking about the time of the future, and it wasn't back in the first century, but I believe he's talking about now. I believe that, that, that after the apostasy and, and the times that we're living today, I think there's evidence, strong evidence, to say that, that we're in that time today where people no longer want sound biblical teaching because it, it drives people away. They say, oh, I don't want that sound, hard, fire and brimstone preaching and, and talking about repentance and talking about how you need to sacrifice and, and do all the things that God really requires of us. They don't want the sound doctrine that helps us to get rid of sin and to talk about what sin is. They don't want to hear about homosexuality being a sin or adultery or, or fornication or lying. And we think about all kinds of things that are in the Bible that simply people don't want to hear about today. 
They don't want to hear about that unrest and, and, and against government, rebelling against government. It's not obeying 1 Corinthians 13, where we're supposed to submit to the governing authorities and to the government because God is ordained. We need to hear that, don't, don't we? And so we need to be preachers of that and teach others the truth of his word. And it's all because times people don't want to hear that, and they are trying to get preachers that will preach their way and preach it flat and round and, and just pre just kind of say, well, we want this kind of preaching that doesn't hurt people, doesn't, don't, don't get them to do things against what they're trying to live their life their way or their lifestyle. Can we have alternative lifestyles today that need to be taught that they're not the right kind of lifestyle that God wants us to live today? And notice the last part says, and they will turn away their years from the truth and will turn aside to myths. The idea of a myth is something's not true. And some people accuse the Bible of being that, but that's not the case. But here they're turned away to truly what is fictitious. Things that are, are not true, that's error, isn't it? When something is not true, it is has to everything to do with whether it's in the scriptures, it's, or it's really actually taught by the Bible, or it's something that's made up. And they will make up their own kind of things. You know, that's out of the creed books. Don't tell me, but that's the creed books and the doctrines of men today that they turn aside from the truth and they're listening to myths rather than to what is right, to fables and the things that simply are not true. He told Timothy to, to do the work of an evangelist and do all we can. And when we don't want that kind of preaching, then it, it, it shows, doesn't it? Because we don't want to hear about lessons about marriage, divorce, and marriage because we, we don't want to hurt people's feelings who are, are in problem marriages. But yet we need to. We need to tell people they need to get out of sin like Jesus did the woman at the well. He told her, you had five husbands. The one you're with now is not even your husband. And so we have to tell people sometimes hard things, but they are still the things that need to be said because God calls us to do what we should do. And then another way that we can apostatize away from the truth is when we no longer, and it's talking about us as an audience, and as we talk about the preachers and, their, and people who get the preachers, and like in the last verses, but now we no longer want to test the scriptures ourselves, and we're back in the pew, and we're listening to these preachers who are, are, have these itching ears and all that. They're scratching the ears of the listeners, and they're all in this way of apostasy because we no longer want to try the spirits, as First John 4 verse 1 says. As John said, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether of, of, from God, because many false prophets, notice that many false prophets have gone out into the world. You know, this idea of deception, that everybody is, is teaching the truth and just doing it in their own different way, that is the biggest lie Satan has ever told. The fact that there's many roads that leads to heaven, that, that, that's something, again, that the devil would love people to have to believe the concept that it doesn't matter really what you believe, what names over the church and all that, what authority you go by, or you don't have to have authority for everything you have to do. I've even heard brethren say things like that. It's you don't have to have authority for everything. And it, in some ways that is causing us to leave the faithfulness of the scriptures because we have attitudes like that. But we need to try the spirits whether they are from God. In other words, prove all things. Hold fast to that which is good, as Paul said to the Thessalonians. Why is that? Because we must not believe every spirit because not everybody's preaching the truth. In Acts 17, verse 11, that's exactly why these, the Bible says about these and um, in these Bereans. The Bible says they were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness and search the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. They wanted to know. And they were not content to say, well, have a preacher say, well, this is what the Bible says. And they get up on the podium and, and make dogmatic statements and often will say, well, you know, and often make jokes and refer to kind of the feel-good preaching of the day where it doesn't really call you to have to look at your Bible very much at all. And that's the problem of a lot of churches today is that we've left sound biblical teaching out the window. And that's why we're no longer maybe testing the scriptures because when you have all kinds of jokes in a sermon, like I listened to one sermon by a so-called brother, that he had so many 
uh, jokes that was in there. He said, well, how many elders does it take to screw in a light bulb? And that was one of his. And he talked about all kinds of jokes uh, in the sense of, I, when I say, well, somebody turn over in their Bible. And I was expecting somebody to, to turn over on the floor and lay their Bible down and turn over in their Bible, literally. And that's kind of jokes and things like that that are humorous. And you can hear in that sermon all kinds of people laughing. But that's not causing people to be edified. And they're no longer testing the scriptures because what is there to test? You know, very few scriptures are used in a lot of sermons like that. And you could count on probably one or two hands uh, at the most how many scriptures are really used in lessons like that. And so that tells us a lot about where our heart is when it comes to testing the scriptures and learning the scriptures and wanting to be like the Bereans to search the scriptures daily. That's what we need to do today is to get back to the Bible for everything. When we leave the Bible, like some people say, well, you know, that book is, is outdated, it's got mistakes in it, and it, not everything's inspired in that book. You know, that's why people no longer want to stay with the Scriptures. And that's why they argue against following and testing the Scriptures. But then also, how people can get away from the truth and start apostatizing uh, whole-scale churches doing this is when we use what others are doing as our sole authority, whether it be colleges of the brotherhood or whether it be uh, papers that are written today. And there's a lot of uh, papers like the Gospel Advocate and, and Firm Foundation and Truth Magazine. We're not to use anyone as the sole authority for what we're doing. We look at other people and say, well, brother so-and-so, brother big preacher, said it's all right to do it then it must be okay. I was actually in a, in a Bible class where a brother actually said that because of somebody was said it was all right in one of these papers. It was Gospel Minutes. He said, if, if brother so-and-so said it's all right, and therefore we can do this, you know, that's not our authority. That's not the sole authority. We're not to compare ourselves what others think or what others are doing. And that's the danger Paul says in 2 Corinthians 10, verse 12. We are, are not bold to class uh, to compare ourselves with some of those who commend themselves, but when they measure themselves, this is the point, when they measure themselves by themselves and compare themselves with themselves, they are without understanding. And so here Paul says they're looking at others and what they're doing. God doesn't grade on the curve, and this truth is not given on the curve. It's basically when we look at what others are doing and, and take them as the standard of authority, what has always, maybe what even what has always been done or what's been traditionally done for years. You know, we need to still look, what does the Bible say? That's the bottom line, isn't it? What does the scriptures, what does Jesus say? Is it from heaven or is it from men? And there's a lot of things that are out there today that are, the others are saying, well, there's nothing wrong. Brother so-and-so says right to have youth ministers and, and youth camps and all that. And, and all this paid by the church and all these uh, kind of entertainment, puppet shows and parades and all that, uh, Church of Christ baseball teams and basketball teams. Those are kind of things we put these things uh, together, connect the dots where we're going with this. When we take what others are doing and say, you know, these churches do this, why can't we? We're actually doing like the Israelites when they said, we want a king just like all the nations around us. We want the same thing. But you know, we need to trust Actually, when we trust in men more than God's word, we need to trust in God more than men, don't we? Men are not our standard, and they're not our true sense of what we should be doing in any respect. Second Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17, notice what Paul says again to Timothy, that all scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate or complete. Equipped for every good work. God wants us to be complete in everything we do. That word, actually, the word perfect is referred to there. This is the attitude of, of having what we need. And we'll do a lesson on what the Bible says about the word perfect in our Thursday Bible study. Be, be sure to stay tuned to that as well. But for now, what does the Bible say here? That all Scripture is breathed by God. It's inspired by God. It's, it's given to us. And that's what is the, the standard of authority is what is written down for us. So we can have every good work and know what to do and it comes to doing what 
God wants us to do. And I want to say something about men of the past, especially oftentimes people say, well, well Alexander Campbell started the Church of Christ, and he's, he's the founding uh, minister of that. that. That's not simply not true, and we'll talk more about that later in another lesson. But uh, a lot of people gave him too much credit and, and gave really too much power in their minds or too much willingness to go with whatever Alexander Campbell wanted to do. And if you know today, Alexander Campbell, he wouldn't be fellowshiped by a lot of the Church of Christ today because of his actions later on. And he flip-flopped and began to adv advocate these kind of missionary societies and things like that. But here's the book, The Search for the Ancient Order, chapter 9. Earl West's book about this says, The American Missionary Society. And here's what it says in part of it. It says, The magic name of Alexander Campbell behind any idea usually was enough to discourage any opposition from becoming too effective. On the other hand, his name frequently caused too ready an acquiescence. And it's basically saying that people gave in or they, they complied with whatever, whatever Alexander Campbell because he was Alexander Campbell. But the problem is, that's not the way it should be. And so that's showing that when you give men, you put too much trust in what men have to say and rather than what God says, that's a problem. And so we should not be giving men that much power in our lives. Men are simply men. We're fallible. And Alexander Campbell was fallible. He was the first president of the, of the American Christian Missionary Society, something we would pose today. And so that's, again, that's, that's a whole different story. We'll talk more about a lesson about that just a little bit later when it comes to the idea of institutionalism and, and can we use, uh, do the work of the church through institutions? Again, that's, a, that's where men got off on these small steps. And it led to something big like the a missionary society and, and all kinds of institutions later on, the same kind of things today. And so all that shows us that we shouldn't trust in men beyond the scriptures. We're not to think of men above the scriptures. That's what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 4. It says, now these things, brethren, I have figuredly transferred myself and Apollos for your sakes. He's, Paul said, I use Paulus and I as an example, that you may learn in us not to think beyond what is written, that none of you may be puffed up on behalf of one against the other. And so he's saying basically that we, can, we can't look at men as having authority, that the Bible's, God's word is authoritative. And his word means everything. The word of men means nothing. And it should not have the same power and authority as God's word does. And finally, I want to talk about the fact that when we embrace error, when we start to embrace rather than reprove error, and I'm talking about basically when churches of Christ start to embrace denominationalism and start to, to do things that they do and, and it rubs shoulders with denominations and, and think, well, everything's good. They're just different people and, and they're following God their own way and we're not reproving that. You know, we need to reprove error and error needs to be said that it is error. Rather than extending a hand to error, we need to back away and refrain because that's what the Bible teaches us to do not to embrace denominationalism and any kind of error that is out there in the world, any kind of false teaching that is out there in the world today. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 11, the ESV tells us, it says, take no part or have no fellowship uh, in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. In other words, instead of joining hands and, and, and saying, well, we're all the one happy family serving God, just doing it different ways. We have different creeds and doctrines and commandments of men. No, we're not to do that. We're the only, the only doctrine we have is Christ, is his doctrine. And the only way we can really follow and worship God is given to us in the scriptures to follow and do things God's way. Now, if it's not God's way, then it's man's way. And that's not as good as what God says. It's, it's poles apart when it comes to, there's really no comparison God's ways are so much higher than man's ways, Isaiah tells us. In Titus chapter 1, verse 13, the ESV also tells us, therefore rebuke them sharply. He's talking to the elders that were to take care of certain things, these Cretans. He told them that, about these Cretans, that you're to rebuke them sharply, that they may be sound in the faith. Now, why would he want them to do that? Because instead of holding hands and saying we're all religious people, no, he can't say that because these Christians 
were liars and they were deceiving people just like a lot of people today who are de deceptive and are saying things that simply are not true to the scriptures of God's word. That's why lessons like this are needed, that we can understand and know the truth, that we're not to leave the scriptures in any way, the small steps or whatever the case, because it's dangerous to do so. And I hope this lesson has been beneficial to you in some way, that you can look at the scriptures and know that God has wanted us to do all that we can and to stay firm in the times of apostasy. There's times when people will leave, like I said, but we must not give in. We must not, uh, we must hold the ground, hold fast to the apostles' teaching. That's why we need to not give in to these kind of, uh, of innovations that come in the church, things that should not be there. When gym, church gymnasiums and fellowship halls, things like that are not what the Bible says we, the work of the church is. And to pay for them through the treasure, and this is the part I have a problem with, when people pay for this from the treasure, making it the work of God, it's the work that money that's collected to do the work of God. When they do that, they are violating the scriptures. God wants us to stay firm and not do anything that violates the scriptures. You know, we can't give book, chapter, and verse that we're to have these kinds of gymnasiums and exercise like that and, and doing all kinds of things, puppet shows and, and Church of Christ, inflatables, things like that, parties and things. We need to do what only what we can find in God's Word and stand fast and teach our children to love God and keep His Word as well. I thank you very much for kind of attention to the lesson today. We'll now we'll conclude with our study for today. Be praying for others that this coronavirus will end, that God will help us every step of the way. Thank you very much for your kind of attention. And now we'll conclude.